Welcome to the first lecture in the course called CMOS Analog Circuit Design. There are 40 lectures all told in this course, and the first lecture deals with the introduction and the background necessary for the following lectures. We will look first at the introduction. We'll follow that by the question of what is analog design. We will follow that by the skill set that's necessary for analog IC circuit design, particularly in CMOS technology. We'll look at some of the trends in analog IC design and where the field is going. And then we'll introduce notation, terminology, and symbols so that we can be consistent in the following lectures. I'd like to add also that the material in these lectures is mostly from the textbooks CMOS Analog Circuit Design, uh, first through the third edition. And the page numbers that you see here correspond to those pages in the third edition. On this slide, we introduce the course objective, which of course is to teach analog circuit design using CMOS technology. The graphic here basically shows the a goal of going from the specifications and being able to come up with a first cut design that would be used as a starting point for simulation in the design process. This slide deals with the course prerequisites which will be useful in the following lectures. It starts with the basic understanding of electronics which includes active and passive components, large and small signal models, and frequency response. It also includes circuit analysis techniques such as mesh and loop equations and circuit concepts such as superposition, Thevenin and Norton's equivalent circuits. And finally it includes integrated circuit technology understanding the basic process steps and understanding how PN junctions can be used to understand the technology. This slide deals with the course organization and it's based upon the third edition of the CMOS Analog Circuit Design textbook. You see it starts from a bottom-up approach. We're starting with the introduction where we are now, moving to devices, then into circuits, simple circuits, more complex circuits, and finally into systems. In this particular course, we will cover technology, modeling, subcircuits, amplifiers, simple op amps, higher performance op amps, comparators, and D to A and A to D converters. We will not cover switch capacitor circuits in this class. This slide shows some references that would be useful for understanding the material of this course and going into further depth in some areas. Number two is, is an excellent book. It's by Gray, Hurst, Lewis, and Meyer, and it's in the fourth edition. If you have this book, I would like to caution you that the authors have switched the notation of the saturation in the active region for the MOSFET. This corresponds more to the notation of a BJT, and you need to be careful when you're reading other textbooks and this textbook to make sure that you don't get confused. These are all good references. Some of the ones down here, such as Alan Hastings' book, which is in the second edition, The Art of Analog Layout, is an excellent book for understanding the analog layout part and the technology part. Then there's good reading in terms of personalities and history in terms of the number nine reference. And finally, number 10 reference is a great reference for being able to understand how to troubleshoot analog circuits. Let's consider the philosophy of the course. This course emphasizes understanding of how an analog circuit design works before using the simulator. Basically, the simulators are very powerful and the circuits are complex. And if you just start using the simulator without thinking about well, how the circuit works, the results are not going to be very good. I've tried to capture that in this cartoon down here where there are basically two paths to analog IC design. One path I call the risky path is where the designer sits at the computer, uses the simulator to do the design. Unless you're very experienced, this is probably not going to result in a successful design. A better path I call the wise path would be to take some moments out, sit down, and think about the circuit, perhaps using pencil, paper, and maybe a calculator. But understand how the circuit works, understand what to change in order to change some performance parameter, and be able to know how and what to expect from the simulator. Then go over and use the simulator to be able to refine what you have done and to optimize or to be able to further explore the design space. 
Now let's turn our attention to answering the question, what is analog design? In this slide we have a illustration of the analog IC design process. It's a fairly complicated illustration, but it has three basic parts that are important to us. The electrical design, the physical design, and then in some cases the testing and product development. We will basically focus on the electrical design and the physical design in this course. The electrical design, as you see, starts with the conception of the idea, goes to the definition of design, and then the implementation. And this is all done without using a computer at this point. And then you would turn to a simulator and get the data that you want from the design and compare with the specifications and see if you need to make any iterations around this loop. Once you're satisfied with this, then the electrical design would be complete. And you would go into the physical design where you're going to be physically defining what the circuit is. And then you would, of course, need to verify that. And then once you have the physical definition of the circuit, you can extract parasitics go back and re-simulate to make sure that the parasitics and the physical design did not negatively impact the electrical design. And then when you're done with that, then you go into a process called fabrication. This point here is typically called tape out. And then depending upon the foundry and how long it takes, you'll get the circuit back. And then you begin the process of testing and verification. This is very similar to simulation in the sense that you're trying to determine whether or not the circuit meets the specifications. So you would be comparing it here with the circuit specifications and hopefully they would meet. If not, then you would have to take a second pass through the circuit before you were able to get to a, the level of a product. Here we want to address the question of what is the electrical design. And really it's a process of going from the specifications to a circuit solution. And the inputs and outputs of the electrical design are shown to you in this diagram. Of course, you have the specifications, then you have the design process, and the outputs are a topology, W over L ratios, DC currents, and perhaps values and components like capacitors here. So the electrical design requires active and passive device electrical models for both creating the design, verifying the design, and determining the robustness of the design. All this step is done without the use of computers. The steps in electrical design are considered on this slide. You begin first with the selection of a solution. And one of the ways to do this is to examine previous designs. But basically you want to select a solution that is simple. Do not get too complicated at this point. Then the second step would be to investigate the solution. Analyze the performance of the proposed solution not using a computer. In the process, you will determine the strengths and weaknesses of the solution. And then you move on to any necessary modifications of the solution using the key principles, concepts, and techniques of analog circuit design to implement the modification. And then you'll evaluate the modification through analysis, still not using computers or simulation. Finally, we do the verification of the solution which uses a simulator with precise models to verify the solution. At this point, any large disagreements between the hand analysis and the computer verification should be carefully examined. This will lead you to perhaps a mistake in your hand analysis or perhaps a mistake in the computer simulation. Either case, this is a one method of being able to find disagreements and to find errors. On this slide, we want to answer the question, what is physical design? Basically, it's taking the information from the electrical design and creating a layout which consists of many distinct geometrical rectangles at various levels. Then this information is taken to create the actual three-dimensional integrated circuit through a process called fabrication. Now, on this slide, we have tried to illustrate this process flow from a circuit, which is a simple push-pull uh, amplifier consisting of an NMOS transistor M1 and a PMOS transistor M2. The drains are connected together and the gates are connected together. This circuit has been represented by this layout over here which is using blue for the source and drain of the NMOS, green for the source and drain of the PMOS, gray for the metal, red for the polysilicon gates, a 
brownish orange for the P well and white for the substrate. So if you look carefully at this, you can see the NMOS transistor here with its source connected to ground, its gate connected to the drain connected to the output. And of course, the gates of the two transistors are connected together. This is transistor M2, which is the PMOS transistor, and its source is connected to the 5 volt power supply, and its drain is connected also to the V out. This information then is used to create the fabrication, which is represented over here in terms of a, of a locos type process, where the PMOS transistor is represented over here as a cross section, and the NMOS transistor over here in the P well. So this represents the physical design process that we will be using in our course. Let's consider the layout process in a little more detail. First, the inputs are the W arrow values and the schematic. Secondly, a KCAD tool is used to enter the various geometries. This typically is a P-cell which generates the various geometries based upon the parameters that the designer gives for a particular component. Thirdly, during the layout, the designer must obey a set of rules which are called design rules. And these rules are for the purpose of ensuring the robustness and reliability of the technology. And once the layout is complete, then the process called layout versus schematic is applied to determine if the physical layout actually represents the electrical schematic. Once that is complete, then the next step is to extract the parasitics knowing now the physical dimensions. And these parasitics typically include the capacitance from a conductor to ground, capacitance between conductors, and the bulk resistance. And then finally, once the parasitics are extracted, they're entered into the simulated database and the design is re-simulated to ensure that the parasitics will not cause the design to fail or to negatively impact its performance. Because packaging is such an important part of the physical design process, we'd like to look at it more closely on this particular slide. The function of packaging is to protect the integrated circuit, to power the integrated circuit, to cool the integrated circuit, and to provide the electrical and mechanical connection between the IC and the ITSAW world. The packaging fabrication steps would include dicing the wafer, attaching of the chip to a lead frame, connecting the chip to a lead frame, and then encapsulating the chip and the lead frame in a package. Typical packages are shown to you up here. This is a dual inline package. This package over here is called a leadless lead frame type package. Some other considerations of packaging are speed and the parasitics that the package would introduce. On this slide, we give a few thoughts about test design. With test design is the process of coordinating, planning, and implementing the measurement of the analog integrated circuit performance. The objective is to be able to compare the experimental performance with the specifications and or the simulation results. The type of tests that would be performed are functional or parametric or static and dynamic. Some additional considerations are should the testing be done before the chip is packaged or at the wafer level? And how do you remove the influence of the measurement system from the measurement? Now we turn our attention to what is the skill set that is necessary to do analog integrated circuit design. And we'll begin by looking at some of the characteristics of analog integrated circuit design. First of all, they're done at the circuits level. The complexity is high, although the number of transistors may not be as large as digital. It continues to provide challenges as technology evolves. It demands a strong understanding of the principles and concepts and techniques of analog integrated circuit design. Good designers typically have a good physics background. Also, the designer must be able to make appropriate simplifications and assumptions. It requires a good grasp of both modeling and technology. And you need to have a wide range of skills, a breadth. Being specialized only in analog is rare. It need to be analog plus something else digital, RF, uh, software, whatever. Be able to learn from failure and be able to use the simulator correctly are all characteristics of analog integrated circuit design. Understanding the technology is very important to the designer in being able to be successful. 
There are two aspects of technology that are important to the designer and that are shown on this slide. The first are the parasitics that are associated with an active device or passive device. I've shown you an example of a MOSFET and a BJT here. The actual transistor is represented by the schematic symbol, but all the parasitics, including capacitances and resistors, are associated with the bulk area and the overlapping and other parasitic influences of the transistors. Then not only do we have that, we have the connection parasitics, where if we take again our push-pull amplifier and we model it with M1 and M2, we will see that the connection between the gates and the connection between the drains and the connection to the sources all is represented by parasitics. These are called connection parasitics, including an inductor which represents the bond wire from the chip out to the pad. So all of these things are quite important in understanding their influence on the integrated circuit design. A second aspect which is important in the analog circuit design skill set is to understand modeling. Modeling is the process by which the electrical properties of an electronic circuit or system are represented by means of mathematical equations, circuit representations, graphs, or tables. Such models allow the designer to predict or verify the performance of electronic circuit or system. Examples of models would be Ohm's law, the large signal model of a MOSFET, the VI curves of a diode, and things of this nature. The goal of the models, particularly the models that are used not in a simulator, but when the designer is doing the thinking and understanding of the circuit, is to be simple and to allow the designer to understand the circuit performance. In the previous slides, we've mentioned the key principles, concepts, and techniques of analog IC design, and we'd like to explain that a little bit more in this slide. The principles mean fundamental laws that are precise and never change. An example of this might be like Ohm's law. Then we move down to concepts, which include relationships, soft laws, which are ones that are generally true, analytical tools, and things worth remembering. Feedback is a good example of this kind of law. Then finally we have techniques which will include assumptions, tricks, tools, and methods that one uses to simplify and understand. And some of the assumptions like neglecting a large resistance in parallel with a smaller resistance or being able to solve for the location of two real axis roots are examples of the techniques that we're referring to in this slide. Although our digital friends might laugh when we talk about complexity in analog design, there is sufficient complexity in much of analog design. Analog design is normally done in a flat manner that makes little use of repeated blocks or hierarchy. As a consequence, it does become quite complicated and challenging. And so how do you handle this complexity? Well, you use as much hierarchy as possible you try to use the appropriate organization techniques to simplify. You document the design in an efficient manner so you can communicate. And you make use of assumptions and simplifications and you try to use the simulators appropriately. This is an illustration of a vertical hierarchy of design with the lower level being components, the next level being circuits, and the highest level being systems. An important aspect of an analog integrated circuit design skill set is the ability to make an assumption. On this slide we see that the assumption is taking something to be true without formal proof. The purpose is to be able to simplify the analysis of the design and the goal of the assumption is to separate the essential information from the non-essential information. The elements of an assumption are first of all formulating the assumption to simplify the problem without eliminating the essential information. Secondly, to apply the assumption to get a result or a solution. And thirdly, to verify that the assumption was in fact appropriate. Some examples of assumptions are neglecting a large resistance in parallel with a small resistance, the Miller effect to find a dominant pole, and finding the roots of a second order polynomial assuming that the roots are real and separated. Now let's turn our attention to the question of where is analog IC design today? As we look back in history, in the 1980s, 
there was a feeling that digital would overtake and replace every analog application. As a consequence, there would be no need for analog designers. Fortunately, that did not happen. And today, there are many established fields of applications that are devoted exclusively to analog IC design. Some of those are listed here. One is digital to analog and analog to digital conversion. A second is disk drive controllers. A third is modems and filters. A fourth is span gap references. Also, we have analog phase lock loops. We have DC to DC conversion, buffers, codecs, and many, many other applications. So today, the existing philosophy that I would subscribe to is that if it can be done economically by digital, then don't use analog. There are enough interesting problems to be solved using analog without going outside and finding those that can be solved better by digital. As a consequence, analog finds applications where speed, area, and or power have advantages over a digital approach. Now, analog IC design is not without its challenges. And on this slide, we have the challenges listed into two categories, into technology and into circuit challenges. In technology, basically we have two approaches that might be taken in implementing an analog circuitry. One would be to design in a technology that is oriented towards digital circuits. Another would be to design in a technology that's been optimized for analog integrated circuits. And that would be a benefit that typically does not happen except in a few companies that have specialized foundries that optimize the analog approach. Generally, the circuit is built using a technology that is used also for digital memory and digital circuits. And while digital circuits have scaled well with technology, that analog has not benefited from the same type of scaling. For example, as technology scales down, in analog speed increases, which is a good thing, but gain decreases, which is not good, the matching between identical components or assumingly identical components decreases, and the nonlinearity of the transistors increases, and new issues appear such as gate current leakage. As we move to some of the circuit challenges, I've tried to illustrate some trade-offs here, but there'll always be trade-offs between linearity, speed, precision, and power. And I've tried to illustrate that to you here with these curves. This is a curve where increasing area, and on this axis we have nonlinearity or precision. And you can see that as the area increases, the precision increases, and the nonlinearity decreases, both of which you would typically want for good performance. However, what that means is you're going to have large devices. On the other hand, if this axis is speed, you'll find that for more speed requires more power, and as you go to higher speeds, your precision decreases because of frequency issues. And furthermore, as your analog circuitry is combined on a chip which has a lot of digital circuitry, you're going to find that there's interference problems that occur through the substrate. So how does the analog designer that has to design analog circuits in a digital technology achieve high performance? Well, one way is to use the digital circuit to enhance the analog circuit. And this is typically called digitally assisted analog circuits. And it uses digital circuits, which work better at scale technologies, to improve analog circuits that don't necessarily improve with technology scaling. Some principles and techniques are listed here under this approach. One was called the open loop versus closed loop. We might recall an open loop that the circuit would be less accurate but faster, which means it's, it's smaller and has less power. But however, to get the accuracy, typically one has to go to a closed loop operation, which is larger in area, and as a result, it's slower and dissipates typically more power. The approach of digitally assisted analog circuits would be to use digital circuits to increase the accuracy of the open loop circuit and achieve the same speed and have less power and perhaps even more less area than the closed loop approach. A second principle or technique is averaging. And this uses the outputs of multiple operations and it 
and connects them together in such a manner that if one is not working well, it's influenced by its neighbors. The result is to increase the accuracy, which results in smaller devices, which means less parasitics and more speed. Another approach is called calibration, where you'll take a method of tuning the circuitry and you'll store that tuning information in a digital memory and then apply that information under during the operation where you need that accuracy of that particular component. This results in increased resolution with the same area, perhaps with a little bit of area uh, devoted to the digital aspect of this. Another approach is dynamic element matching. This is the approach that enhances the component precision by using a pseudo-random selection of somewhat identical elements and over the process of time in this random selection of these elements, you increase or enhance the accuracy of the component. We'll go into more detail in our, our following lectures on this topic, but right now we just want to touch on a high-level viewpoint of this. And finally, doubly correlated sampling. This is a method of removing the low frequency or DC noise and uh, causing the circuit to have uh, more accuracy uh, less noise and resulting in smaller devices and more speed. And of course there are many other approaches that could be listed here as well. Let's conclude the introduction section by looking at the topic of notation, terminology, and symbology. In this table I have the definition of symbols for various signals and they're based upon the quantity which I represented as Q and the subscript which I have represented as A. If the quantity is lowercase and the subscript is uppercase, then that represents the total instantaneous value of the signal given as lowercase q subscript capital A. On the other hand, if the quantity is uppercase and the subscript is uppercase, that represents the DC value of the signal. If the quantity is lowercase and the subscript is lowercase, that represents the AC value of the signal and then the fourth category is a capital quantity or uppercase quantity and lowercase subscript and that could represent any of these particular signals in this category. I tried to show you an example of this with drain current as a function of time and in this particular case if we go to this exact point of the waveform, any, in fact any point of the waveform could be represented as a total instantaneous value of the signal which would be given in this case by lowercase i capital subscript D. On the other hand, the DC value, which is given by this dotted line, would be indicated by capital I and lowercase capital D uh, for the DC value. And then we have the AC value, which is referenced to the DC value, and that's given as lowercase i and the subscript lowercase d. And then finally we have the fourth category. In this case, this would be a peak value with a capital I and lowercase d sub m. On this slide we have some symbols for MOS transistors which will be very important to our study. The first symbol here shows an enhancement and MOS transistor with a bulk connected to the source. Over here we have the equivalent transistor for PMOS. If the bulk is not connected to the source then we can use this symbol here which shows the terminal B which represents the bulk or the well of the transistor and this is for an NMOS transistor and over here is the same symbol for a PMOS transistor. Quite often if the designer knows what is being used simpler symbols might be used such as indicated here for the NMOS and over here for the PMOS but it depends upon the preference and the technology as to what is actually used. Other symbols that we will be using are shown on this slide. The triangle was typically used for a differential amplifier, an op-amp, or a comparator. Then we have independent voltage sources which can be represented by these symbols here. And then an independent current source which are represented by these symbols here. Typically I will choose this symbol for the current source and either one of these for the voltage source. Down here we have voltage control and current control uh, sources. There are four types. The first one is a voltage control voltage source. The second is a voltage control current source. 
the third is a current control voltage source, and the fourth is a current control current source. These are all designated by diamonds. And so if you see a diamond with either a plus minus sign in it or a circle uh, arrow in it, this represents a control source as opposed to the circles which represents independent sources. Lastly, let's take a look at three terminal notation. This has always been an interesting aspect and one that one would find in a data book or data sheet. Typically, you'll find some quantity with three subscripts, and I'll call those subscripts A, B, and C. In terms of a transistor or an active device, typically A is the terminal with the larger magnitude of potential, B is the terminal with a smaller magnitude of potential, and C is the condition of the remaining terminal with respect to terminal B. And so C, if it's given zero, means there's an infinite resistance between terminal B and the third terminal. There's no connection. If C is equal to S, this means there's a zero resistance between terminal B and the third terminal. If C is designated as R, then there would be a finite resistance between the terminal B and the third terminal. And finally, C equals X implies that there's a voltage source in series with a resistor between terminal B and the third terminal in such a manner as possibly to reverse bias a PN junction. Some examples are given to you down here. The first example is CDGS. What that means is the capacitance from the drain to the gate with the remaining terminal, which is the source, shorted through this DC voltage source, which is an AC short, to the gate. Over here we have an example of IDSS. This is the current flowing from the drain to the source with the third terminal gate shorted to the second terminal source. Over here we have BVDGO. This is the breakdown voltage from the drain to the gate with the source open circuited with respect to the gate. And so these are some examples of this three terminal notation and you will see more of this as we go through the course notes. So to summarize the introduction, we've seen that successful analog IC design proceeds with understanding the circuit before using the simulator. The analog IC design consists of three major steps. The electrical design, in which you'll find the topology, the W over L values, the component values, and DC currents. The physical design, in which you'll do the layout, and then the test design in which you'll do verification and testing of the integrated circuit. We also saw that analog designers must be flexible and have a skill set that allows one to simplify and understand a complex problem. Analog IC design has reached maturity today and is here to stay. There are many areas in which analog design is the best way to implement the, the circuit. The appropriate philosophy would be if it can be done economically by digital, then don't use analog. As I said, there are enough challenging problems to be solved by analog without having to go do problems that can be done better by digital. As a result of the above, analog will find applications where speed, area, and or power result in advantages over a digital approach. And we're going to see that deep submicron technologies, scaling of, of VLSI technologies, will offer exciting challenges to the creativity of the analog designer.